Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society, and today I'm joined by a face that is very, very familiar to our audience, Dr. Joanne Manson, who I am so thrilled to be interviewing. Dr. Manson, can you remind everybody who you are? Hi, Marla. It's wonderful to be here. I'm uh, Joanne Manson. I'm chief of the Division of Preventive Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and I'm also past president of the North American Menopause Society. So in your title is that all too important word preventive. And this study made me sit up and look at it because it really translates prevention into action and outcomes. So tell us first about the study and why it was important to do. This is a study in what's called the United Kingdom Biobank that is very large, includes more than 135,000 UK adults. And it's looking at an American Heart Association metric called Life's Essential Eight. And it includes five lifestyle behavioral factors plus three cardiovascular risk factor um, risk factors. So these um, factors, overall eight of them, include not smoking, having regular physical activity, healthy diet, healthy weight, and healthy sleep, sleeping a duration of seven to nine hours a night. Also. Um, having good blood pressure, blood cholesterol, and uh, blood sugar levels. So we divided everyone into three groups, whether they score low, medium, or high on this life's essential eight metric and looked how at how those scores related to their life expectancy free of major chronic diseases free of cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and dementia. So it's really looking at health span, not just life expectancy, but years of life expectancy free of chronic diseases and healthy years ahead. What we found was a very strong association between doing well on this metric having more factors that were favorable in terms of behavioral risk factor status and having a, a longer life expectancy free of chronic disease estimated um, in the study. And that really is what's so important because there's one thing to live long and we look at our lifespan of 75 to 80 plus years for most people, even longer. But if you're living them qualitatively poorly, and lose your activity of independence um, or social connectedness and the ability to really enjoy love. That really, I think for so many of us is what it's all about. So when you say they scored high, that was something that was positive, meaning they had good blood pressure, good cholesterol and so on. They did well on um, having life's healthy lifestyle behaviors as well as having healthy risk factor status for blood pressure, blood cholesterol and blood sugar. And between the three groups, was this more of a linear relationship that if you scored poorly, you could expect longer years of chronic disease or did it, did it impact life expectancy as well? It, it was interesting that those who scored well had the longer life expectancy free of chronic disease, as well as a compression of the life expectancy with chronic disease. Mm -hmm. So it was relatively linear. Um, the better the score, the longer the life expectancy free of chronic disease. And overall, for, for men, there was an average of an additional 25 years of life expectancy free of chronic disease. For women, 30 years. But wow. the difference between those who scored low and those who scored high was a extra seven years in men of life expectancy free of chronic disease and in women an extra 9.5 years free of chronic disease if they scored highly on this metric compared to those scoring low. So here was a surprise when I looked at your study and I'm hoping you can walk me through it. We often think about social determinants of health 
as being a multiplier or a qualifier that can impact outcome in almost everything. So if you come for a poor educational background or a poor socioeconomic background, how that did that or did that not trigger into this in terms of modifying if you had a high score, did you still do well? It's a really great question. And we were very much interested in how socioeconomic status, educational level, income level, and what's called the Townsend deprivation score, which is sort of a measure of adversity, how that would relate to the number of years that could be gained in life expectancy free of chronic disease. And we found very similar gains in life expectancy free of chronic disease across all educational strata. If they scored high, they right. gained the same amount as those who scored lower um, in terms of education, socioeconomic status, income, and the Townsend uh, adversity score, deprivation score. So it makes me wonder, does behavior and lifestyle, which really is within our control, so it's something that we can do, it may be difficult to do, but we can strive to do this, really come across all comers if you do it as having the same type of beneficial outcome? I think it will benefit everyone across all socioeconomic groups, but a really key variable is how accessible the ability to be physically active and to have a healthy diet is across these socioeconomic groups. And I think we need to do more in terms of health policy and social policies in making healthy lifestyle practices more accessible and affordable for everyone because across all groups, major benefits will be derived. So perhaps the economy is, is that if you can access healthcare and you can achieve this, you will do well, but perhaps having a poorer score in terms of social determinants of health means you cannot access these and that limits you right from the get-go. It, it may mean you're less likely to be able to access. And I think it's so important for clinicians to be educating patients about the importance of these lifestyle factors and to say that this appears to extend health span, years of healthy life, as well as overall life expectancy. And this may be a major motivator for many patients, but for those who are struggling to have these lifestyle factors accessible to them, healthy diet accessible to them. This may be a much more complex issue for those patients. And of course, trying to explore with the patient how to have, you know, be able to walk in neighborhoods that are safe, um, in parks that are safe, you know, this is, is worth discussing, but sometimes these issues will be so complex that the clinician may not really be in a position to solve all of the problems. Right. But I think the important message here for me when I read this is, is that it's so powerful now to be able to tell our patients that we really can link the change in behavior and the change in lifestyle into an outcome that's measurable and in a sense, longer periods of being disease free, which after all is something I think we all strive for. Yes, I, I think that this study strongly suggests that. And previously there's some there was evidence that lifestyle factors are very important for individual outcomes, such as preventing cardiovascular disease, preventing cancer, but hadn't previously been looked at in terms of life expectancy free of all of these chronic diseases. So I think this, this is further evidence for the importance and the power of lifestyle uh, behaviors and prevention. Um, but again, there are the caveats that we really need to do more to make these um, lifestyle factors accessible to everyone. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with us and reviewing this with us. Uh, thank you for having me. It was great talking with you. Bye for now.